let's get into disorders. Um, here we've got some very interesting um, disease states which touch on very pressing areas of research in bioengineering today. Talk about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, MS, schizophrenia, and depression. Okay, Parkinson's. I mentioned it's at least initiated by the loss of the dopamine neurons. And these are neurons that make a particular chemical neurotransmitter. It's a small chemical. It's one of these things that diffuses across the synaptic cleft. And it's made by a series of enzymes uh, and gets loaded into vesicles. Uh, it acts on receptors that play major roles in controlling movement, memory, reward, planning, nausea, milk uh, uh, letdown or, or prolactin secretion. And it gets pumped back into the cell with dopamine pumps. Things like cocaine and amphetamines, they prevent the reuptake of dopamine, so it hangs around longer in the cleft and you get more dopamine. Uh, but it's also very important in movement. Uh, this incredible diversity is, shows some of the problems we have in designing good therapies. You can't just give dopamine back everywhere in the brain because you're going to have pretty serious side effects if you're adding back all these functions or revving them up. And in fact, that's what we often see. Um, and here's some of the anatomical pathways that subserve these different functions. You're in. Uh, you know, if you're in the substantia nigra where these neurons live, there are projections going uh, all over the brain doing different things. Uh, the nigrostriatal pathway plays a role in movement. This is why you get Parkinsonian, major symptoms of Parkinson's. You get bradykinesia, which means slow movement. You move very slowly, you're very stiff. This is called rigidity, and you have a resting tremor. And that's all largely due to this uh, pathway. Then. There's the mesolimbic pathway, number two. This goes to a structure called the nucleus accumbens. It's a subcortical structure that's involved in reward and pleasure. And so this is probably where the drug of abuse uh, patients who are treated for Parkinson's by revving up their dopamine can get into issues like increased seeking of reward, pathological gambling behaviors. Uh, that is a very interesting probably spillover between the action of dopamine and those two Mesocortical goes to the frontal lobes, the frontal cortex, and that's involved in uh, attention, planning, and memory. And one thing we see in depression is patients become, in, in Parkinson's, is patients become depressed and also demented. They can't form long term memories, and that's probably related to that projection. Then you've got this uh, tuberoinfundibular pathway, as it's called, which, actually, which goes to the hypothalamus and helps. That in turn goes to the pituitary gland, which controls uh, prolactin secretion and uh, milk letdown during nursing. Very different functions. In fact, if you, uh, some antipsychotic medications that modulate dopamine can actually cause lactation even in men, which is a pretty interesting. In fact, there's a lot of lawsuits going on about that. Um, so, uh, this treatment for the first 10 years or so of Parkinson's, you can treat it with this medication called L dopa or levodopa which is a form or precursor of dopamine that can be uh, absorbed from the GI tract and can cross the blood-brain barrier, which tends to, which is part of the vasculature of the brain that tends to prevent charged or polar chemicals from accessing the brain. But this works. It really helps them for about 10 years or so with the major symptoms. It doesn't really help with posture, gait, or dementia or depression. Uh, and there are side effects, abnormal movements, the pathological gambling as well. Dystonias are twisting and repetitive movements, and dyskinesias are sort of jerky movements. And as you get overactivity of the pathways, you get those. Yeah, um, well, it's, it's uh, at its course, at its most fundamental level, it's, it's having an overly optimistic view of the outcome of what's going to happen. So you have people who, if you ask them, they, and you can actually do very well structured uh, laboratory tests of, of people who are experiencing this, they'll simply have a higher, more optimistic uh, assessment of the outcome of a, of, of a likely uh, risky endeavor. And so in terms of pathological, what that means is they're hurting themselves socially or, or economically. And, and so you see people with Parkinson's, you know, about 5 to 10 percent of them will incur, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go and gamble when they didn't before, or if they were gamblers, they'll gamble. 
suffer uh, uh, socially or economically. So pathological just means it's causing a problem. Okay, that's Parkinson's. Alzheimer's, uh, pretty interesting, uh, and probably it's going to dominate our medical landscape actually in the coming uh, decades uh, because a fraction of the society that's going to be sitting around with Alzheimer's is, is going to stop. Uh, but we don't know really what causes it and we certainly don't have effective treatments. It's memory loss, it's personality and behavioral changes, impaired planning, goal-directed activity. You have loss of amyloid proteins, which you have accumulation of amyloid proteins and you have loss of neurons. This is an extracellular protein that builds up in where plaques, you get tangles of proteins inside cells, you have reduced cells and synapses throughout the brain, including a kind of cell that re releases a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. There are, there are very, very minimally effective treatments. There are drugs that inhibit breakdown of acetylcholine, like Aricept, but they have tiny, tiny effects on, on the cognitive problems, and so really, we, we really don't have a good some modulators of glutamate receptors, a different neurotransmitter, help it. But again, very, very tiny effects, even questionable that there is an effect. The problem with that is it's all across the brain, so it's hard to think of a, of a focal intervention, a transplant, an electrode. It's, it's very diffuse, so hard to treat. Multiple sclerosis, this is an interesting one. This is a demyelinating disorder. So this is where you lose the myelin uh, sheath. And that, as we'll talk about in our next lecture, the peripheral nervous system lecture, that will reduce the fidelity and speed of propagation of action potentials along axons. And because of all, that's a very general thing, and so depending on where this, this tends to show up sort of focally in little patches, and so wherever that patch shows up, that's where you tend to see the problems. And so you can get very different things. You can get, you know, uniocular blindness. You can you get sudden loss of function of an extremity. Uh, you can have uh, funny sensations, uh, what are called paresthesias, tingling. You can have uh, weakness. And this tends to progress. It gets better. It gets worse. There are versions that are called relapsing, remitting, and then there are rapidly progressive. Uh, we think it's an autoimmune disorder, and there are treatments that dampen down immune responses that help a little bit. Um, very often, visual symptoms are the first ones, which for reasons we don't know. An example of what some of those patches look like. Uh, they show up on certain kinds of MRI scan, those little white patches in the brain. lose this uh, sort of fatty sheath, which is there to reduce the capacitance of the axon, and so you have high capacitance, and that reduces the uh, propagate. Schizophrenia, getting into psychiatry. We have very little solid anatomical findings in, in uh, psychiatry, uh, nothing that can help you on an individual patient level to make a diagnosis, but if you average across many patients, there's larger ventricles in schizophrenia, which are these fluid-filled cavities in the middle of the brain. What does that mean? Does it, is it just an epiphenomenon of some other developmental problem? Does it mean they have less wiring uh, space available and so they can't communicate from one part of the brain to another? We don't really know. They also tend to have smaller hippocampal uh, structures. So what's going on there? Well, you know, we know that if you give people too much dopamine, you can get psychosis too. What is psychosis? That's altered perception of reality. And so that includes hallucinations, paranoia, uh, and drugs that block dopamine receptors tend to be those that are therapeutic in, in uh, including the type 2 dopamine receptor, so haloperidol being one of them. Uh, and so this is, you know, but we don't have a deep circuit level understanding that dopamine is involved somehow. Uh, we think using functional brain studies that different parts of the brain maybe are not in sync they don't show, are not normally coactive uh, as they would be uh, in the normal case together. And they're asynchronous. And so one thought is that there's just one part of the brain is not telling the other part of the brain what it's doing. And so an auditory hallucination might be the patient's own inner thoughts that aren't recognized as such. And in many cases, there's a sort of a running commentary to the auditory hallucinations, which is not too dissimilar from what your own internal thoughts uh, may be. Depression, this is what one of my clinical uh, focal areas. It's very, very common, um, very chronic and recurrent. Uh, you know, even if you treat someone successfully, most of them will have a, a severe relapse within five years. Um, very, very much of a problem. Both of these are very biological. So, you know, they have very different symptoms. 
depression, you have this hopelessness, worthlessness, guilt, thoughts of death. Schizophrenia, it's more delusions, hallucinations, disorganized behavior. Very costly, different epidemiology, sort of one versus 10 percent moment, but both very highly genetic and they share some features, reduced hippocampal volume. The point of this is to show you very biological, physical, very costly and common. And yet this is, this is the level of our understanding. We don't know at the tissue level, at the circuit level, what's going on. We just know that there are these very debilitating, diverse uh, symptoms. And, um, major, major opportunity for quantitatively minded uh, engineers to make headway.